Well, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are at, whatever time of day it is. This is, once again, your favorite speaker, Dr. Ronald Brown, and I am going to be presenting you with another exciting lecture, which blend religion and politics, current events, but with a very strong emphasis on the future. And as you can see from the slide, our topic today is the megalopolis or the super city of the future. As you can see on the picture, the city is the focus of human evolution, the future of human identity. And so the future is going to be dominated by cities and not just cities like New York or Paris or London, but the megalopolis, giant super cities. So once again, on the left, you see the outline. We're gonna do a little bit of background on the rise of the city. Where did the cities come from? Why were they invented? Second would be global migration. One of the features of humanity since ancient times, but has intensified most recently with literally millions of people every year being forced or encouraged or pushed to leave their homelands. And of course, they're not migrating to the farms of Idaho. They are migrating to the growing megalopolises of the world. Third, financial globalization, industrial, globalization of culture, globalization of religions, very important feature in the city of the future. An aspect of the city of the future that we don't often think about is that they will most likely be temporary. And finally, number eight, the megalopolis in space. So get ready. We are going to go into the megalopolis, the megacity of the future. So let's get going. Well, where did the cities come from? Well, as we all know, humanity evolved from our ape ancestors in most likely what is today Ethiopia, up in the highlands, climate change, um, genetic um, evolution, whatever caused our early ancestors, various branches and various species, to descend from their trees where they said sought safety for uh, millions of years and to begin to walk upright. The hands changed so they could grasp things. They evolved over time. Well, first they were nomads, meaning they would still go up into the trees for safety at night probably, but then they would be down on the ground chasing after small animals for food digging up roots, picking up berries and fruit. Gradually, they realized that it was probably easier to scatter seeds of their favorite plants in one place where there was plenty of water and sunshine, and then settle down and let the plants grow, keep other wild animals away. And you had the beginning of the domestication of animals and of plants, and finally, you have the beginning of the first villages gradually growing into small towns. And as one ruler of one particular village or town would get more and more strong, he would conquer the neighboring villages, force them to give him a big chunk of their wheat harvest or so many wild animals or so many uh, fertile young women or even provide him with slaves. <clears throat> Gradually, one person would emerge as a very powerful leader, bring a large number of agricultural lands, animals, 
towns and even cities under his control and would declare himself the emperor. The first great empires were in the Middle East, where is today Iraq, Turkey, Syria, Palestine, and down into Egypt. On the right, we see the Babylonian Empire. We see the city of Ur, just below Babylonia, which is the city of Abraham. So we have the rise of great cities, Ur, Susa, Babylon itself, Nineveh, these great ancient cities of empire. Well, the king would gradually centralize power in his capital city. He would decorate it with monumental temples. Think of the hanging gardens of Babylon. He would establish temples to worship the god or the gods of the people. Organize army. People paid taxes. People had to do labor, forced labor. He would write laws. Gradually, reading and writing evolved in these early and growing and prosperous cities. So you can say civilization is linked to the growth of cities. First kingdoms and then expanding empires. A perfect example of this growth from tribal nomads to kingdom is, of course, in the Bible where you see on the left the divided lands of the 12 tribes. According to the Bible, the 12 tribes, beginning with Joshua, entered and uh, took over um, the, the um, cities of the land of Cana. Uh, we all know about the walls of Jericho <clears throat> and the extermination of the people. Uh, as the Hebrew nations took over. King David, around the year 1000 BC, managed to conquer the last powerful city that had resisted the 12 tribes, and that was the ancient Jebusite capital of Jerusalem. Recent archaeologists have uh, discovered that the city was walled powerful walls, it had temples, it was a rich and powerful city. It was probably called Suralem or something like that, where we get the name Jerusalem. King David conquered the city. According to the Bible, he has slaughtered the adults and turned all the children into slaves for the um, kingdom. He built his temple and under Solomon, the great powerful leader, the kingdom of Israel became an empire spreading from the Sinai the whole way up, taking over chunks of Saudi Arabia, modern day Israel, Palestine, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, and up into Iraq. So Solomon's kingdom became a great empire. So here we see in a nutshell, the transition from nomadic tribes to empire. And of course, we see the centrality of the last holdout against the Jewish domination of Palestine, the land of Cana, was the city of Jerusalem. Well, this process has been repeated uh, many, many times. For example, we see the rise of the city of Madrid. Spain had been a Roman colony, then it was conquered by the um, Germanic tribes and then taken over by the Muslims. And in the mid 1400s, you had a very aggressive King Ferdinand and Queen Isabel of Castile and Aragon, who got married, and then they set out to unite the Spanish peninsula. Of course, they fired all the other kings, one king. They tried to stamp out all of the different dialects and languages which were spoken. 
one language, which was the dialect of the capital city of Madrid. One law code, one religion, Catholicism, all the Christian, all the Protestants, all the Jews and all the Muslims either converted to the official state religion or they got out. One army, everything centralized in the capital city of Madrid. Well, the rise of Madrid, unification of Spain, and the or organization of a new nation state proved to be very, very successful. The Spanish beginning in 1492 ended up sailing across the Atlantic, discovering the Americas. Spain claimed everything from California and Florida down to uh, Argentina, taking over the Philippines, building colonies uh, in Africa. So this new nation state ideal proved to be very, very successful. The United States did the same thing. It took 13 little colonies along the Atlantic coast, a great diversity, Dutch in New Amsterdam, New York, Puritans in New England, Catholics in Maryland, <clears throat> slaves all throughout the South and even up into the North, Indians everywhere, German Moravian immigrants in the Carolinas, you name it, they were in the 13 colonies. Well, George Washington from his first capital city, New York City, the Empire City, decided that if he was going to unite these colonies into one country, he needed to build a new capital city where everyone could feel at home. And so, once again, the capital city, Washington, D.C., was built on the Potomac, halfway between the North and the South, and it became instrumental in forging a common national identity. The same process was followed by most of the countries of the world. London gradually expanded its reach beyond the city and the middle and southern half of Great Britain, united the Norman invaders, Angles and Saxons and Jutes and Vikings and Irish Celts, Scots, Irish, united them all, and the capital was London. The English of London, the British royal family in London, created the empire, which once again, like Spain, spread out, conquered half of the world. Paris did the same thing, uniting and conquering the parts of France, forcing them to become French, like the people of the Provence, the Germans and Alsace-Lorraine, all were united under one new government with Paris and the King of France at its head. Moscow, Berlin, Rome, Beijing, all did the same thing, creating what we call the nation state. Now in the United States, we also call them a country. The country of the United States emerged from 13 colonies. And techni technically we call them a nation state, meaning a state, the government, and the nation is one people. In the case of Spain, Catholic, Spanish speaking, following the one king in Madrid. So the rise of cities has been central to the evolution of humanity until the present. In fact, if you look at a map of the world today, you see that it is filled with nation states, countries, each with its own capital. In fact, many nation states today are building brand new capitals. Think of Brasilia, where I was uh, exactly a year ago as I speak. A uh, vacation visiting the brand new capital carved out of the interior of Brazil, a new capital for a new nation, cutting its ties with Portugal and Europe and creating a new 
national identity. Think of Abuja trying to unite the Muslim north of Nigeria with the Christian and animist south trying to unite the tribes, the languages, the religions of this massive giant country into a new identity with a new capital. Astana in um, Kazakhstan, trying to unite the Christian and Russian North with the Muslim South through the instrument of a brand new capital city. Well, many people are saying that we are now approaching the end of the age of nation states. Donald Trump, of course, is trying to keep America great again. Limiting migration, make America great, make it like it was in the beginning, go back to our white Anglo-Saxon Christian roots. Get rid of Jews and Muslims and Buddhists and Hindus and all these other weird people. Make America great again as it was back in the early part of our history. Vladimir Putin sees himself once again resisting globalization, resisting the forces of history. Make Russia great again as it was in the glorious days of the Russian Tsar. Prime Minister Xi Jinping in China make China great again, the Middle Kingdom. And in India, you have the BJP once again saying, India is a Hindu country. Get rid of Jews and Christians and Muslims and other miscellaneous people. Make India great again. Many people would say these are the last gasps of the nation state. The future is no longer with the nation state. The future is with the growing megalopolises of the world. If anybody has an idea what a better future of megalopolis could be, feel free to let me know. I say megalopolises, which is rather awkward, but I haven't found a better substitute. So what are the forces reducing the power and the importance of the nation state? What are the forces tearing the nation state apart and giving rise to the greater New York megalopolis or the Shanghai region or the Mumbai giant region, which is no longer part of a nation state in reality, but becoming a new entity. Are we leaving the age of the nation state and entering into the age of mega cities. Well, what is causing the decline of the nation state? Well, it is globalization. Well, globalization has many forms. It can be economic, as we see from the graph, money flowing around the world. In fact, everything in my home office in front of me today comes from a different country. I just noticed that my whiteout was made in Thailand. My computer was made in China. The keyboard was made in Pakistan. My mouse, it says Hewlett Packard, but it was made in South America. Cultural globalization. We're watching movies from around the world. I just watched a phenomenal Chinese sci-fi film. And you just clicked on the uh, remote and you could switch from language to language. Globalization of religions, globalization of politics. But first, we're going to talk about the globalization of peoples. And this is the phenomenon which has existed for a very long time that is now gone into overdrive in these first decades of the 21st century. This is the migration of people. 
Thomas Friedman wrote a very important book called The World is Flat, a brief history of the 21st century. And if you want to be dramatic, you could say a brief history of the third millennium. For him, the world is flat. Everything flows freely across borders. Money flows, ideas flow, and people flow. We are developing a world society with people going from country to country, but even more importantly, going from megalith, megalopolis to megalopolis. When we look at the graph on the right, we still see that the United States is the number one destination for international migration. Millions of people flow into the United States almost every year. But they are not going to Idaho or Louisiana. The vast majority are sell settling in the East Coast megalopolis from Boston to Richmond, Virginia, or the West Coast megalopolis from San Francisco to San Diego. Germany, just this past year, accepted a million immigrants, mainly from Africa and the Middle East. Russia, accepting millions of immigrants from Central Asia and Asia and other countries. Saudi Arabia, Great Britain, United Arab Emirates, where I spent a wonderful vacation a couple of years ago. And of course, Canada, France, Australia, and other countries attracting immigrants from around the world. So the world is flat and people are taking advantage of this new flat world. Global migration turning us into a global population where people don't care where you were born, where you went to school, where you grew up. You are a person, a global citizen. The graph, bar graph at the bottom shows migration to the United States. Beginning with 1900, the high point of immigration um, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, high point of immigration, predominantly Italian immigrants, Eastern European immigrants, Jews and Christians and Orthodox Christians. But then gradually pop, uh, immigration started declining until about 1965 when the gates of immigration to America were reopened. And there you see skyrocketing immigration. Well, these new immigrants coming in were Chinese, Koreans, Vietnamese, Indians, Pakistanis, Bangladesh, Mexicans, Central Americans, and a handful of Europeans. Well, this is causing a lot of anguish in the eyes of many people. Samuel P. Huntington, my old professor at Harvard, said, who are we, America? Well, his answer is, and President Donald Trump, one of his greatest students, would agree we should turn the clock back to 1965. When the United States was white, it was Christian, and it was European. And so Donald Trump trying to ban Muslim immigration, building a wall with Mexico, get rid of, get rid of the DACA million people who were brought here as children, but are still not citizens. Round them up, send them home, get rid of them. They are not Americans. Well, in spite of Samuel P. Huntington and Donald Trump and many other national leaders, such as Macron in France, uh, are trying to stop this mass migration of people. But 
the nation state is no longer able to control it. In spite of the wall that Trump is building to keep out Hispanics and Central Americans, more drugs are flowing across the border than ever. More people are sneaking across the border than ever. So mass global migration is one of the features of the 21st century and will probably remain so. These mass migration of millions are being spurred by many different um, forces. The picture on the left, you see me there in my shorts and my bag. When I was working for the United Nations in Southeast Asia, one of the big migrations of the Vietnamese boat people. Of course, we had to find places for them to go. Many countries didn't want refugees. That was a major problem, but they managed to be settled. I remember one group I uh, convinced to go to Sweden because they couldn't hear the difference between Sweden and Switzerland. And so they all thought they were going to go to nice, rich Switzerland with a nice, balmy climate. And they were outraged when they landed in a, a Stockholm, Sweden, with 10 feet of snow and 50 degrees below zero. But they were part of this great wave of migration. As we speak, in 2020, millions are taking to small boats trying to cross the Mediterranean from the Middle East, from North Africa, to find refuge in Europe. Millions of Black Africans from southern half of Africa, Arabs from Algeria and Egypt, refugees from Palestine, from Syria, from Jordan, from Turkey, from Iran and Iraq and Afghanistan, flooding in to Europe. Well, of course, nobody in Europe is welcoming them with outstretched arms, but you can't let the boat sink. You rescue them, and then you have to make accommodation. The bottom on the right, you see Donald Trump's famous wall. Stop the flood of migrants fleeing poverty, war, global warming poverty, trying to get into the United States. Well, in spite of Donald Trump, the immigration, the migration goes on. Now, when these migrants end up reaching a city or a mega city or a megalopolis like the New York area, they go to where the jobs are, they go to where people of their own background have already settled. When you look at a map of just the city of New York, you see some predominantly white areas, but then you see um, Jewish areas, Polish areas, African American areas, uh, area uh, groups from the Caribbean islands, Af black people from Africa, Mexicans, every kind of Hispanic, Russians, Russian Jews, Russian Christians, Koreans, Chinese, you name it, there are neighborhoods in New York where these people settle. Now, one of the characteristics of these people is they are not intending to assimilate. They preserve their language, their cultures, their religions. And rather than a melting pot, we are ending up with a salad bowl. They are becoming half American, but half where they are from. They don't identify with people from Idaho or even Texas. They consider themselves perfectly happy in the megalopolis of the greater New York area, from Boston to Richmond. They can carve out their neighborhood. They can have an American passport or retain their Chinese passport, or maybe even pick up a Brazilian passport on the way. They are more New York megalopolis citizens than they are American citizens. 
the megalopolis of New York, which is, as you can see on the map, extends a whole way up into lower New Hampshire and Maine and down well into Virginia, is becoming a megalopolis, a mega city in its own right. Population is well over 50 million people. Now, you see it includes states, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, a big chunk of New York, and all of New Jersey, Eastern Pennsylvania, the whole way up to Harrisburg, Delaware, Maryland, Washington, DC, and a big chunk of Virginia. This is where the millions of migrants from around the world are going. They're not going to Buffalo or Pittsburgh or Erie, Pennsylvania to the extent that they are settling in this mega city. You can get on the highway uh, in uh, Manchester or in Boston, the I-95, go the whole way down to Richmond and not have one red light. Amtrak, Excella, zips up and down this coast carrying people. So it is possible to live in Hartford, Connecticut, work in an office in New York City, and have a summer home in Allentown, Pennsylvania. People migrate back and forth in this area. Say, are you a resident of New York? Well, yes, I live in New York, but I work in New Jersey. So this is becoming a political, cultural identity in its own right. Now, two factors recently spurred the expansion of the New York megalopolis. First was 9-11. With the destruction of the World Trade Center, the banks, the insurance companies, the investment companies in lower Manhattan, along Wall Street and Broadway, very quickly realized that it was very dangerous having all of these companies squeezed into one tiny area. I know this very well from Toro College where I teach. Our computer center was in the brand new World Trade Center. We had taken over a couple of floors. That's where our big new computer center was. Well, of course, it was destroyed. Until Christmas of that year, I didn't even know who was actually officially enrolled in my class because students didn't know if they were accepted. They didn't know whether they were registered. They didn't know whether they were getting scholarships because the computer system went down. So following 9-11, banks, insurance companies, Toro College, other, NYU, all decentralized. Big banks would set up satellite offices in Long Island, in Connecticut, in New Jersey, so that if New York would be bombed again, the business could continue. So you had a decentralization of a lot of New York City institutions as they built satellites in the greater megalopolis area. Well, COVID-19 accelerated that, where groups like the Metropolitan Museum, Broadway shows, the Metropolitan Opera, realized that having everything concentrated in one building in the middle of Manhattan was dangerous and financially a disaster. So museums like the Metropolitan started taking big chunks of its collections and having traveling exhibits or opening up branch museums where um, treasures of the Renaissance and treasures of history could be cycled through branch museums so that everything was no longer concentrated in Manhattan 
but you could have a branch of the Metropolitan Opera putting on uh, operas in New Jersey or Virginia or New Hampshire. Online banking. You could go to a bank anywhere and I can use my Chase Bank card. Broadway shows. Why well, have to come to New York, spend a fortune in a hotel, eat in overpriced restaurants, pay a fortune for a Broadway show when Broadway can come to a, to a uh, auditorium in the middle of New Jersey, in Eastern Pennsylvania. So 9-11 and COVID-19 spurred the expansion of New York gradually taking over huge areas outside the city limits, which we now call the New York megalopolis. NYU building campuses all over, not just the megalopolis, but all over the world. Why have everything concentrated around Washington Square? A bomb in Washington Square could close it down and the university would go bankrupt. So build campuses. Well, now, especially since COVID-19, online education is further decentralizing education, moving from the city center to the megalopolis region. Now, of course, we see many examples of the megalopolis becoming an identity in itself. An easy pass. You can drive the whole way from Boston down well into Virginia and never have to pay a toll. Well, there's still great cooperation between the states which constitute the megalopolis. Board of Education. Today, as I'm speaking, we're in the middle of the third outbreak of the COVID-19. Well, Connecticut, New York City, upstate New York, Long Island, New Jersey, education departments, all are trying to coordinate their education systems. Many kids from New York have transferred to upstate New York or to Connecticut or to New Jersey where the schools are open. And so there shouldn't be competition between the education departments in the megalopolis, but cooperation. Department of Health, Taxes, Port Authority of New York and New Jersey are all being forced to rethink their orientation. New York State Department of Health, well, it has to cooperate with Connecticut, with even Massachusetts, with New Jersey, Pennsylvania, because the COVID-19 does not recognize state borders. So if mass migration is causing the megalopolis to grow in population and causing all kinds of challenges as the city is replaced by the megalopolis, financial globalization is another factor which is eroding the power of the nation state and dragging the world, kicking and screaming, if you believe Donald Trump and Samuel P. Huntington, dragging the world into the age of global finance. I can go to the bank and buy money from any country in the world. Half of what I eat or wear, all of the electronics in my, um, home office come from a different place. If uh, somebody in China wants to open a brand new company, well, it can list itself on the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, Japanese Stock Exchange in Tokyo, London, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Frankfurt, even Mexico City or Buenos Aires. You can go anywhere to raise money. In fact, Shanghai Stock Exchange and the Hong Kong Stock Exchange are now 
bigger than the New York Stock Exchange. Well, even the Chinese say we can hardly control this flow of money. You know, Donald Trump is saying the United States should not invest in Chinese companies. Well, according to Martin Jacques, China is going to rule the world. China can't even control this free flow of money. The United States can't. If the United States doesn't want you to buy into a Chinese company in New York, well, you just contact a Paris stock exchange and buy your stock on the Paris stock exchange. Money flows around the world. The US dollar is still the number one currency, but it is gradually being rivaled with the euro. Uh, with the Chinese uh, um, yuan or the Japanese yen, even the British pound and the Swiss franc uh, are holding their own and growing in importance. China is, of course, expanding its economic empire. The Silk Road, see the map where it says China, Xi'an. I spent a wonderful vacation there, which is the end of the Silk Road. You follow that, you go from the heart of China into the Middle East, uh, Samarkand, into Tehran, Istanbul, and up into Europe. This is a highway, a network of roads, canals, bridges, railroads, tunnels, so that you can take products pr produced in China and in a matter of days, they can be on the shelves in department stores in Germany or England or Russia. The Maritime Silk Route, at the bottom from China, linking Jakarta, uh, Colombo, Sri Lanka, Calcutta in India, Mombasa in Africa, Djibouti, and going by ship right up to the heart of Europe in Venice. And so economics is linking us into one country. While my Prime Minister Xi and Donald Trump and Putin want to retain the power, the economic power of their little nation states, the reality, on the other hand, is the growth of a global economy that nobody can control. Even China is having problems keeping its own megalopolis under control. The Yangtze River Delta, centered around Shanghai and the surrounding area, now has a population of over 90 million people. The laws are being harmonized. People travel in bullet trains from one area to the other. The Shanghai megalopolis is becoming so rich, so powerful, being swelled by millions of immigrants and not just from China, but from everywhere in the world, that China can no longer control the megalopolis. Many people say the megalopolis should just be declared its own independent political entity, such as the New York megalopolis. When I was in Shanghai, I mean, you'd go to one neighborhood and it was Little America. I went into a grocery store and asked the lady at the counter, I said, do you have peanut butter? She looked at me with an insulting look and said, do you want crunchy or smooth? Meaning the America, American neighborhood in Shanghai is part of this globalized megalopolis. And in Shanghai, you have little France, little Germany, little Russia, little Africa, little Israel, all the young Israelis who don't want to do military occupations, uh, military duty 
in the West Bank and Gaza. They flee, settle in Shanghai, and become part of this brand new ethnic neighborhood called Little Israel. So we talk about Shanghai, the city, but Shanghai is really a region. 90 million people, booming industry, booming economy, millions of immigrants flowing in from all around the world. This is what the world of the 21st century is going to be dominated by, a collection of giant megalopolises. A second Chinese megalopolis, which rivals that of the Shanghai, is what they call the Hong Kong megalopolis, the Pearl River Delta megacity. See it on the right, the picture on the right, all of these giant cities, Sichuan, Hong Kong, Gangzhou, all creating one giant economic political entity with over 70 million people. Once again, the people in Hong Kong, as we have seen just recently in the news, they say, yes, we are part of China, but we are different. We have our own identity. This region, yes, it is on the map. It is part of China. They are nice states and Chinese bureaucrats from Beijing come down and try to tell them what to do. But more and more, the Hong Kong megalopolis is becoming an entity in itself, demanding more and more autonomy, if not outright independence from the nation state of China. Another aspect of globalization, which is propelling the growth of the megalopolis is industrial. As I mentioned earlier, people migrate where the wages are high. They buy off the products which are the cheapest. And so if I go out to buy a computer, I'm not going to insist that it's made in America or demand to know where every part is actually made. I want a good computer that will last forever, that will uh, do all the work that I need. So whether it's a piece of clothing or a car, I don't care where it is made. Now, of course, people go wherever the wage is good. Whether you're a factory worker in the United States, or whether you are a computer programmer or a medical doctor, you go where the wages are. People are migrating to the New York megalopolis because wages are high. Products flow around the world and even Donald Trump can't stop them. Just look at New York over towards New Jersey, giant container ships going in every day. Los Angeles, Long Beach, California, ships coming in with products made around the world. Even when it says made in USA, I couldn't care less where it is made. Even if they try to say it was assembled in the USA, but with parts made all around the world, I don't care. There was a study and they took out a particular automobile. They took out all the parts and they tried to identify where each individual part was made. So when you take a car, you can't even say assembled in the United States or made in the USA because everything is a global product. And this not only affects the giant megalopolises of uh, uh, Hong Kong area, Shanghai, New York area, or Mumbai area, but it affects the whole world. The third world, poor countries of Bangladesh and Pakistan, India, Brazil, Peru, they are part of this globalization 
of industry, of finance, and of population. A couple of years ago, I spent a wonderful vacation in India, my second visit there. And I went to Goa, which is on the coast, the Indian Ocean coast, and then I went up inland to Puno, and then I went to what is called the Gateway to India, which is the old city of Bombay, or today, Mumbai. This is the headquarters of still another megalopolis that is growing in importance. At one time, the British, when they built this lovely uh, archway, called it the Gateway to India. Well, more and more, it is becoming a gateway to and from India as products, immigrants, investment flow out of the country and go around the world. And the exact opposite is happening of flowing into India. There's me on the right at one of the yoga festivals uh, that I went to with people from all over the world. This was the World Yoga Community, the International Sadhguru Foundation. Once again, showing how global every city is becoming and especially the megalopolis. Here we see the triangle of Maharashtra. It is a giant area, population of well over 80 million people being linked from Mumbai into the interior Nagpur, where you can have an, industri an industry making automobiles, for example. Every part is made in a different city, put on one of the bullet trains traveling back and forth migrants flowing into this booming megalopolis from all over India. Religions mix, languages mix, cultures mix. A huge American population in Mumbai, many of them having both American and Indian, if not half a dozen other passports. I have a friend who lives in Mumbai. She's from South Africa. She also has six other passports. She considers herself a global citizen, passing easily from one megalopolis to the other. Mumbai city, see it on the right, the yellow, the old English built city. Actually, it was built by the Portuguese uh, Bombay, which means simply bum, which means good, and bay, which means a bay. So it was a good bay, a good harbor. So it was established by the Portuguese, taken over by the English, constantly expanding inland, and is now no longer a city, but it is a megalopolis. The area is linked by bridges, by skyscrapers, harbors, container ships. In fact, many people say it is not even a part of India anymore. They feel that the government in De New Delhi is holding back the expansion, the wealth, and the growth of Bombay. Uh, New Delhi passes a law regulating immigration. Bombay does everything it can to escape from these barbaric laws being written in a far distant city in the interior, saying we should have more autonomy, if not outright independence from the nation state of India. Another aspect of globalization is of course the globalization of culture. Cultures flowing around the world. Wherever I go, you can get the World Wide Web, you get Google, you get YouTube, the internet. You can watch movies online from anywhere in the world. Globalization of culture is a reality. Lady Gaga is a international personality. 
Chinese sci-fi movies and historic dramas can be watched around the world. Mexican soap operas can be accessed from anywhere in the world. And so the culture of the megapolis of New York has very little to do with the American culture. When Donald Trump says, I want to go back to the past when America was white and Christian and European, well, the megalopolis of New York has left that myth behind in the dust. Even if people in Idaho and North and South Dakota cling to this vision of a white Protestant Christian America, the megalopolis of New York has nothing to do with that. It's interesting to see the recent presidential election between Biden and Trump. <clears throat> On the left, we see the blue states, which voted overwhelmingly for President Biden. On the right, we see the megalopolis of New York. Very interesting. My family lives in middle Pennsylvania and are all dyed in the wool Republicans. Pennsylvania was a toss up state. In fact, the city area, Philadelphia, part of the New York megalopolis, was fiercely democratic. Immigrants from all over the world, African Americans, all voted. Democratic. Those areas outside the megalopolis ended up voting Republic. And so the growing cities of the United States, and especially the growing megalopolises, are firmly Democratic, while the rest of the country is firmly Republic. And so you see not only the rise of the megalopolis as an economic and cultural reality, but losing less and less attachment to the rest of the country, where the area from Boston down to Richmond, Virginia, could very easily just cut itself off, declare its independence from Republican-controlled interior, and become a new political entity, which there is a good chance just might happen in the future. The Chinese are part of this growing diversity of the megalopolis. We see the diasporas. When you come to the megalopolis of New York, or Shanghai, or Hong Kong, or Mumbai, or the other emerging metro, metro, me, megalopolises, you are struck by their diversity. Chinese are settling everywhere. Even smaller cities like Mexico City now have a flourishing Chinatown. Americans move to Mexico City where they retire because their social security check goes much further. No matter where you live, you can be part of your national culture. You get news from all over the place. The globalization of culture in New York. Every evening, I listen to CNN news. I listen to BBC news. Franz von Katra, whenever I can, I listen to Russian television, Chinese television. I can log on and watch sci-fi movies from China. I can watch documentaries from Britain. I can watch music programs from India or Brazil. No matter where you live, you can preserve your language, your culture. There are many people who have been born in New York who still consider Russian or Chinese or Spanish their first language. In New York and every other mega city, newsstands carry magazines, books, 
newspapers from every place in the world. And many of them are free. You can live in a megalopolis of New York, but you were born in Egypt. You can be riding your camel across the desert, jabbering on your cell phone with your cousin in the megalopolis of New York, your sister who is working in Shanghai, and your brother who just moved to Mumbai where he is successful in business. Cheap air travel is also spurring on this globalization of ideas, of culture, and especially of news. Well, the, of course, China is not happy with the growing independence of the Hong Kong megalopolis. India wants to keep the Mumbai megalopolis firmly under its thumb. Donald Trump wants to control news, control immigration, control industry, control the free flow of money. But it is a losing battle. When you get a document on the Freedom of Information Act from the government, sure, they'll give you the document, but half of it is censored. Desperate attempt by national governments to control the free flow of, of information. Remember, the world is flat information flows freely. Well, governments try to control it. Donald Trump tried to ban Huawei in the United States. Israeli censors what happens on the West Bank, the latest atrocity. China blocks Facebook, Google, YouTube. Many times magazines and newspapers like the New York Times or the uh, Wall Street Journal will be banned in a country for some reason. But this is a losing battle. I can get, even without a um, cable or go online, and I can get the latest news on what's happening in Afghanistan or in Russia. Countries are no longer able to control the free flow of information. Well, of course, people like Samuel P. Huntington, until his recent passing, were irate. Donald Trump wants to go back to a time when American government could censor the news and we only learned what they want, what the government wanted us to hear. But unfortunately, <clears throat> the ability of the governments of the world to control information is no longer possible. People like me consider myself a global citizen. I hear something on the CBS News in the evening, and it sounds a bit suspicious. I click to Russian TV, Al Jazeera, Israeli TV, and I get a very different perspective on what is happening. So our information is contributing to the growth of a global citizenship, a global identity, which is flourishing in the megalopolises of the world even though the American, Chinese, um, and Indian governments try to control the megalopolis, they are becoming uncontrollable. Another aspect of globalization and the megalopolis is the globalization of religions. I also teach world religions at a theological seminary here in New York, the Unification Theological Seminary. And this would be a very typical textbook, which I would use where they list the 12 major world religions, um, Christianity, various forms, Buddhism, Sikhism, Islam, Hinduism, Judaism, Confucianism, Zoroastrianism, Baha'i religion, Shinto, Jainism, and Taoism. These would be the traditional 
religions of the world. Well, as John L. Esposito argues, religion is also being globalized. What we today or in the past considered the 12 major world religions, today we would have to expand it to 120, if not 12,000 major world religions. Religions are going global. So many millions of Muslims from the Middle East and Africa are migrating to the megalopolises of the world that they cannot keep up with mosque construction. In New York, even in Paris, in Shanghai, in Mumbai, you have people filling the mosque as you can see in the picture on the left, but then the overflow simply takes over the street. In the middle, we see a replica of the Temple of Solomon built by a Brazilian evangelical church, which began in the slums of Rio and is now spreading around the world this new Latin American evangelical Christianity. And not just through Brazilian migrants, but through missionaries. Uh, you can go online and you can have, uh, access their TV program. You can go on the internet and get tons of information on the Igreja Universal. Muslims in Paris, the French government is doing everything it can to reinterpret Islam, make it fit in with the French national identity, but the sheer masses of my, my Muslims in France are charting their own course. 10% of the population of France is now Muslim. Billy Graham, who died just in 2018, was one of the very first people who started taking new and small religions and taking them global. I remember hearing him preach in Moscow, just as the Iron Curtain fell, I worked at his last um, major um, revival meeting in Flushing Meadows Park here in New York City. In the middle, we see the giant Mormon center in Jerusalem. So small religions or religions which were relegated to one particular area are now going global. On the right at the bottom, we see, um, I believe it's a Sikh temple, which is now flourishing in London with migrants. Orisha devotion, the Yoruba religion from West Africa through migration has become a global religion. Santeria, which was the folk religion of the Cubans, now has temples and performs rituals all over the world. I went to a Santeria celebration when I was in Shanghai because so many Cubans are leaving Cuba and finding a less than a warm welcome in the New York megalopolis, they find job opportunities in Shanghai. Mama Lola, who took Haitian voodoo global, has her main temple in Brooklyn, is considered one of the leading authorities on Haitian voodoo, which is no longer Haitian voodoo. It is a world religion. And it's not just through migration and missionaries. Missionaries are very important for evangelicals and Mormons. But other religions are attracting people and converts. Imagine the Santeria, the music of Santeria, the mysticism of the Yoruba religions, the magic of Haitian voodoo, 
attracts people from all over the world. I went to a voodoo ceremony uh, in Berlin a couple of years ago. There was not one person from Haiti there. They were all blonde hair, blue eyed, white skinned Germans who had, as they say, converted to voodoo. Other religions going global. On the left, you see me again. That was when I was on vacation in Ethiopia. The Ethiopian Orthodox Church, long relegated to the mountains of Ethiopia, is now becoming a global religion. Through migration, many African Americans have identified with this African version of religion. See me in the picture, the roof of the church, which is carved out of stone. Hare Krishna, well, that we remember when that went global. Every bus station and train station and street corner was filled with these converts to Hare Krishna. Custo Botanica, a magic shop from the Hispanics, predominantly Mexican, bringing their magic, their rituals, their superstitions, we would call them, but making this folk religion from Mexico into a global presence. Our Lady of Guadalupe, the sacred Marian apparition that happened in Mexico in the 1500s. Well, now there are churches of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mumbai for the large Mexican population. When I was in Dubai, I went to a Mexican Catholic church and it was called our Lady of Guadalupe Mexican Catholic Church in Dubai, taking rituals, ceremonies, symbols, global. Well, one of the features of the megalopolis is religious pluralism. When you see the church, uh, um, Jesus Christus e o Senhor, Igreja Universal, the Reino de Dios, the Brazilian Evangelical Church, well, they are now a presence all over the world through migration and especially through conversions. In the middle, you see the Lubavitcher Jewish Center in Bangkok. Here again, so many young Jews have migrated to Bangkok that the Lubavitchers have a center there. Well, it is an uphill battle because many of the um, Israelis are marrying Chinese girls or Thai girls. The kids grow up half Jewish, half Thai, or half of nothing. So nobody questions your religious identity in the megalopolis. You can be a migrant from Tuba in Senegal, a follower of the great Sheikh Ahmed Bamba, and you can be living in the Mourid area of Mumbai or Shanghai or Dubai. You celebrate your religious holidays, you invite your friends, and there is no such thing as religious persecution. Think back when Spain was united and became the nation state. First thing was impose Roman Catholicism as the official religion, force the Protestants, the Jews, the um, Muslims to either convert or get out. Such a thing would be impossible in the megalopolis because your subway system would grind to a halt your stores would close, your factories would shut down. So the megalopolis is becoming the most wonderful celebration of religious pluralism and religious tolerance. The Chinese Confucius Institutes are spreading Confucianism around the world. And here we see in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania in Africa, when I was in Cameroon, I went to a Confucius Institute at the university. 
You had all of these black students learning Chinese, learning about the teachings of um, Confucius and Confucianism, which was the religion of China, is now becoming a global religion. Another aspect of the megalopolis is they are largely temporary. In fact, on the right, you see the Peter Bishop's uh, book on the temporary city. Not only, not, not so much that the city itself is temporary. Rome will always be Rome, but it is not expected to remain stagnant. Populations come and go. Industry moves from place to place. A lot of the manufacturing which dominated the Shanghai uh, megalopolis is now simply moving to new mega cities in Vietnam, in Pakistan, even to Mumbai. People go where the jobs are. When I was in uh, Dubai, the girl at the front desk of the hotel was from the Philippines. She was living in Dubai, saving up money, sending her brothers and sisters to school. And she had just spent three years working in Shanghai. And she said she wanted to go to the, one of the mega cities in South America. She took her job with her, just like me. I mean, seven years in Switzerland, five years in Jerusalem, five years in Boston, a year in Moscow. I could see when, or maybe I should say, if I ever retire, I could just take my diplomas and experience and end up teaching at a university in Mexico. English is the global language of education. I, since I speak French, I could teach anywhere in Africa where the official language is French. So with this flat world that Thomas Friedman so celebrates, everything flows freely across borders. Nation states and nationalistic leaders like uh, Putin in Russia, like Xi in China, even Donald Trump in America cannot halt this free flow of everything, which means I don't have to stay in one uh, megalopolis. I could live in New York as I have for the last 20 years and then just go off and live somewhere else. My identity is of the megacity. I find that I have more in common with fellow New Yorkers than I do with the rest of my family in Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and Arkansas. I have, in many ways, become a global citizen. I feel comfortable in Mumbai. I find my, my smooth, skippy peanut butter in Shanghai. And I don't really care where my clothes are made, where my whiteout is made, where my pens or my computer is made. Everything is flat and everything is temporary. Another area which really emphasizes the temporality of this new emerging megalopolis is the Persian Gulf. If you take the map from Dubai, where I spent a wonderful vacation, up to Kuwait, you find that Dubai to Kuwait with southern um, Iraq and the southern coast of Iran, around the Persian Gulf, it is literally on the verge of becoming a megalopolis. These countries have more in common with each other than they do very often with the giant countries of Saudi Arabia. Southern Iranians have more in common with the people of Bahrain, Qatar than they do with the rest of Iranians. And so this area has the potential to become still another 
megalopolis, where people, as in Dubai, could have any religion, build their houses of worship, something that you don't expect in a um, Muslim uh, area. Dubai, where I spent my wonderful vacation, is a perfect example of a temporary city. Everything in Dubai and the Persian Gulf is marked by, is it gonna be there tomorrow? the giant oil platforms in the Persian Gulf. Well, they are like islands floating in the Persian Gulf. Drive into the desert of Abu Dhabi and you see the giant oil rigs pumping out oil. These are cities built on oil. As recently as 20 years ago, there was nothing there. They emerged, built with oil money, attracting migrants from all over the world, attracting capital, attracting businesses, but nobody would weep if they would disappear. In fact, um, in Dubai, when I was there, um, I was struck by how many people from all over the world. Well, then later I read an article that with the outbreak of COVID-19 and the decline of air traffic and tourism and industry, over 10% of the population of Dubai, the foreigners, had simply up and moved somewhere else. They're not attracted to Dubai. They're perfectly at home at any of the great global cities or the metropolises. There's a picture of me in Dubai on my way to the top of the 150 floor tower. Well, there's nothing more artificial than Dubai. Built on sand dunes, thrown up every week, a new tower goes up, filled with immigrants who are there, doctors from India, computer programmers from Pakistan, um, um, scientists from China, bankers from the United States, educators from Germany and France flooding in, filling the towers, but it always appears artificial, temporary. Look at the island, the famous palm tree island. I mean, built where nothing existed. This is a giant housing development spectacular, attracting people, exciting, a tourist attraction, the sailboat tower on the right built on an artificial island. Well, the whole thing could disappear tomorrow. So how does a growing megalopolis like the Persian Gulf area manage to stay alive? Well, Dubai realized, as there are the other countries in the area, realizing that there's less and less demand for oil and there is less and less oil that can be pumped out cheaply. So are these cities going to survive or will I fly back to Dubai at some time 10 or 20 years in the future and find that it is all gone back to sand dunes. Well, a megalopolis is vibrant because of new people coming in, new people see an opportunity, they jump on it and they breathe new life into the megalopolis. This is not a farm in Idaho. This is not some um, little factory in the middle of China the dynamic, ever-changing population of these megalopolises constantly reinfuse life into a megalopolis such as Dubai, which could very easily disappear. So what is Dubai and by implication every other megalopolis doing to stay vibrant? Well, in the case of Dubai tourism, giant tower. I mean, I really don't know if it was ever necessary as an office space, but I went to the top and had a spectacular view. 
um, uh, Dubai is attracting the education industry. NYU has its giant Abu Dhabi campus. The Louvre rotates its artwork from the Louvre in Paris through regional decentralized museums around the world. The Chinese have a giant Confucius Institute, which is not only teaching Chinese language, but Chinese culture. And immigrants bring their own cultures with them. And so Dubai is diverse. In fact, I have this from the African and Caribbean General Trading Company. Well, I would go there because I could find Caribbean and African food. I went to a Chinese grocery store because it was the only place where I could get my favorite French red wine. And so these cities to remain vibrant, to remain alive, have to constantly reinvent themselves. The um, Emirates Airlines, a major attraction to keep the city alive. When I flew into Dubai, I was on my way to Mumbai. I ran into tons of Australians, flying from, from Australia to Singapore, Singapore to Dubai, and then to Europe or America. So you do what you have to to survive. And with the city of the future, if you don't survive, you will die. The foreign born population of Dubai was well over 80. In fact, a, a city like Dubai is constantly advertising to bring in new talent. Skilled people go where the jobs are, where the money is. When I had my ankle operated on a while back, I was shocked to find that my anesthesiologist was a blonde hair, blue eyed guy from Brooklyn of Irish and German ancestry. Well, I was suspicious because he was the only American in the hospital helping me. My doctor was from Saudi Arabia. The office staff were all Spanish speaking from South America. My nurse was from uh, the Philippines. In fact, the people who were cleaning were from the Caribbean island somewhere. I mean, this is the uh, lifeblood of the city of the future, attracting people, advertising to get people to come, to keep the megalopolis alive, growing in power, adding to its cultural, linguistic, and religious diversity, doing nothing to stamp out religious diversity, and keeping the city alive and vibrant. Well, the people who live in these megalopolises and the areas that aspire to be a megalopolis, such as the Persian Gulf, uh, are global citizens. They consider themselves more loyal to themselves, their career, and whatever megalopolis or megacity they find themselves living in. Now, of course, people like Donald Trump and Xi and Putin and others are very suspicious of these people. Um, the FBI considers them all potential spies. Chinese are constantly being arrested in the United States and in Silicon Valley as spies stealing the secrets and sending them back. The United States has a list of, of uh, Israeli spies. Jonathan Pollard, who as I speak was just released from prison and went to Israel, born and bred American who switched sides and started working for the Israelis. 
So national governments are very suspicious of people like me, global citizens, who is at home in New York as I am in Paris, as I was in Shanghai, that I won't say I don't consider myself a loyal American, but I consider myself much more a global citizen. And what Americans and a lot of other, especially Americans hold against the megalopolis of New York is precisely, we don't want to melt. Why should a Hindu from India give up his or her religion or language or culture or cuisine dump, being dumped into the melting pot, melted, and becoming an American. In the megalopolis, the melting pot is not the goal. The goal is the salad bowl. Multicultural education. Remain Chinese if you live in Flushing. Enjoy American culture. Get together with your Jewish friends for the holidays, your Muslim friends, your Irish friends. Everybody should retain their identity. There's no reason to stop the uh, uh, proliferation of new religions, new cultures, new ideas. The melting pot uh, is largely a thing of the past. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that Donald Trump is not firmly trying to reestablish the melting pot and said, if the uh, Chinese or the Muslims or the Jews or the Koreans or the Mexicans don't want to melt, then they should get out, according to Donald Trump. Whereas in the megalopolis, diversity is celebrated. Now to wrap all this up in our glorious visit to the future, well, we now have a look into the city of the future. And here we see the city, the megalopolis of the future. Ultra-modern, spaceships floating in space, colonies on other planets, drawing the best and the brightest from around the world to inhabit these new cities in space. I recently watched for about the 10th time the fascinating film with Matt Damon and Jodie Foster, Elysium because it really showed what an entire civilization, not just a megalopolis, but an entire civilization rotating in space. And on the right, you see the space colony rotating the earth as the earth is being destroyed by pollution and warfare and strife. A new civilization is being built on an artificial world uh, floating around the earth or maybe even flying off into the universe. As we speak, the Chinese are um, constructing space colonies, uh, are making plans for them on Mars and on um, the moon. I love the poster for Star Trek because it was the next generation. Well, look at the faces in this generation. They are not only black and white and Asian looking, but even aliens will join in creating the next generation. So the megalopolis is here. It is here to stay. So, for those of you who are afraid of the future, move to Idaho and register for the Republican Party. But those of you who are enthusiastic about the future, move to the great megalopolises of the world where the future is already 
the present. So once again, everybody, this is Ronald Brown. Ron Brown, thanking you for joining me in another exciting excursion into the future. Once again, there's me going up into the Burj Khalifa Tower. Once again, the tallest building in the world on me is in Rio, uh, uh, another emerging mega city with many of the characteristics of the megalopolis. So I'm still traveling. I'm still making videos, still exploring the 21st century and the third millennium. So if you have any questions or comments or anything you'd like to add, definitely feel free to send me an email to ronbrownmedia at gmail.com and I will get back to you as quickly as I can. So. I hope to see you at some future video in this series. And thank you again for joining me. So have a lovely day and I'll see you in the near future.